the shooting range. Happy New Year, dear friends. And thank you for staying with us for another year. Now that 2020 is over, we want to wish you and your families a prosperous and great start to the next decade. I want to wish you, in fact, we want to wish you the best of luck to you in the game. And don't forget to lead your teammates to glory. Win even more battles and trophies. And above all, stay safe. In this episode, Pages of History, Sydney Cam's insane brainchild, triathlon, a test of piston engined tops, and Metal Beasts, the Swedish flying school desk. We don't review Swedish tech that often in our episodes. So today's a special day. With all due respect and honor, we present to you the Saab SK-60B multi-role combat capable trainer jet with a battle rating of 7.3. The Vietnam War made the armies of the world consider building a light attack aircraft for direct support of ground forces. And the SK-60 trainer jet turned out to be perfect for that. Its pilots sit shoulder to shoulder, originally to improve communication between the student and the instructor, but also highly useful for actual combat situations. The aircraft is propelled by a twin turbojet engine. Self-sealing fuel tanks are situated in the wing and the fuselage. The hardpoints can carry some rockets, air-to-surface guided missiles, and gun pods. Thanks to its air spawn capability and a decent climb rate, the SK-60 feels pretty comfortable in air battles. Once you spawn, Set your climb to 10 to 12 degrees and go up. As soon as you see your first enemy, level the aircraft to regain lost speed. Having some powerful and accurate 30mm autocannons, you'll have no problem shooting down enemies in a frontal attack at distances above 2 kilometers. If your enemy is smart enough to dodge, it won't save them. The Saab's lightweight build and amazing aerodynamics provide exceptional flight performance. Don't get too excited about dogfights, though. If you lose your momentum, it'll take some effort to regain it since your thrust-to-weight ratio isn't as exceptional. Each time you join a duel, keep aware of your surroundings so that no random passerby can get an easy frag on your behalf. You've got a nice amount of ammo. 150 rounds per cannon, which will last you three or four enemies if used sparingly. Anyway, it's an attack aircraft, so the best usage case for it is naturally mixed battles. Its agile handling will come in handy at low altitudes, while the suspended armament covers all tastes and preferences. First of all, it's the gun pods with 30mm autocannons that we've mentioned before. The AP shells they use provide penetration of up to 47mm, enough even for light and medium tanks. Second, there's a set of 12 M56D rockets, a special treat for fans of death from above playstyle. Thanks to their high accuracy, you'll be able to direct your aim at enemy tanks' rooftops. Finally, the third option for you is air-to-surface missiles. The SK-60 is the lowest-tier aircraft with such missiles. The RB-05A is a mighty advantage against any, and we mean any, enemy anti-aircraft vehicle. Unfortunately, the Saab can only carry two of them, which means it'll have to go back to the base to reload pretty soon. There's no fixed armament on this jet, so you might want to keep an eye on enemy air respawn points to retreat in time. Are Sir Sidney Cam and his people bonkers? 
that's what the Western military had probably thought back then. After all, shouldn't such a wise and experienced aviation engineer understand what the aircraft of the future would look like? We've already got American Phantoms and British Lightnings, the fearsome airborne predators with climb rates and speed so high they can ascend almost vertically and accelerate almost up to Mach 2. Still, in the foreseeable future, it would be the all-powerful rockets that would take the lead with their capabilities of reaching almost any place in the world and hitting the target before it even knows what's going on. So, what's Sir Cam doing? Well, Sir Cam was building a vertical takeoff and landing jet. Though it wasn't a completely new idea, of course. It had been experimented on before, but all the results had shown that it was highly sophisticated and nigh hopeless. A fighter jet like that would never get close in its flight performance to the best traditional ones. However, Sir Cam wasn't bonkers after all. He'd managed to put his finger on the cyclical nature of military aviation development, and he was right. The jet era was a lot like World War II times, with a rapid development of new aircraft and a growing sophistication of technologies. You see, the first monoplane fighters such as the Wildcat or the Hurricane could basically take off from any field, while the best machines of 1945, like the Mustang, the, the Tempest or the Thunderbolt, needed a smooth concrete airstrip of a kilometer or more in length. Still, these best fighters the Allies had didn't completely overtake the Wildcats or the Hurricanes right after they hit production. The old machines were still pretty much in use in every place without a good aerodrome, which, come to think about it, represents quite a wide range of situations. And now, what did they have? Oh, the much-praised supersonic interceptors that required a field of concrete the length of a freight train. Never mind a hundred other things needed for a simple takeoff. Alas, it wouldn't be piston engine bombers to come and destroy all these cutting edge aerodromes. It would be the all powerful missiles. Yes, the very ones that can turn the concrete, the hangars, the workshops, and the fuel tanks <laughs> to ash. Faster than the command realizes what's going on. So, what could be done? Build a Harrier, that's what. It wouldn't set any new records in flight performance, but it'd take off in a field, or off a small escort carrier's deck. It wouldn't even get to Mach 1. It wouldn't have a record range or record payload, but it would be able to hide in the landscape, survive a surprise attack, and then deliver its modest but still very much capable and needed firepower onto enemy bombers. It would be able to destroy enemy tanks, suppress air defense, do reconnaissance, or provide comms. All the while doing it much faster than even the fastest helicopters. Of course, that would require a whole new engine with thrust vectoring nozzles, which meant gargantuan research effort. Sir Sidney Cam wasn't afraid of it, though. It was 1961 an international tension rose almost daily. The American, the British and the West German militaries demanded prototypes of this original aircraft for testing. It wasn't the Harrier back then, though. The prototype's name was Kestrel. Most people already realized that machine would be a groundbreaking one, a machine that would leave its mark in history. But no one actually knew how noticeable that mark would become. But that's a story for another time. It's been a while since we last held a triathlon among piston engine fighters. And back then, it was a competition of mid-tier machines. Well, today, it's time we compared the performance of the tops. So please applause our honorable contestants. The American P-51H Mustang. The German Tar 152H1. The Soviet LA-9. The British Spitfire F Mark 24. The Japanese Ki-84 Hei. 
Italy sent its G56 to participate and put up a special racing livery for the occasion, while France is represented by the F8F1B Bearcat. All these aircraft are completely maxed out and have a minimum fuel load. Our first test will be pretty vanilla for aircraft. A steep climb to an altitude of 5,000 meters. Our contestants are taking their positions on the runway with their radiators 50% open. Let's go. They pick up speed and take off. Each pilot's going for their optimal speed and climb angle, respectively. Around one kilometer up, the Spitfire seems to be gaining some lead. Two kilometers, three. The German and the Japanese planes start lagging behind. And the British pilot is the first to finish. Sometime later, the imaginary line is crossed by the French plane, with the Italian not far behind. Other contestants finish later still. Well, time for the next leg. And now we're going to test what speed they can achieve in a nosedive. The winner here is the aircraft with the highest flutter point. The pilots close their radiator flaps, push the sticks, and down. The wingtips start buzzing. It's 750 on the meter. 800. The Bearcats pilot reaches their maximum of 827 kph and falls out of the race. The G56 and the Ki-84 could hold a little longer. The next planes to leave the race are the LA-9 and the TA-152. The British Spitfire managed to reach a speed of 875 km per hour. But the highest speed today is demonstrated by the American Mustang. We see 890 on its speedometer. Well, time for the next stage where we'll check the best turn speed at an altitude of one kilometer. Let's go. The first to handle this is the British Spitfire. A little more time for the pilots of the Bearcat and the Mustang. The next plane to complete the circle is the Japanese Ki-84. The Italian and German planes lag behind. And the last to finish is the Soviet aircraft. Three stages are done now and we could wrap it up. But what competition would that be without shooting or bombing? Let's pick our targets for them. The American B-29 bomber the British Centurion Mark III tank, and the Italian R3 T20 light SPAAG. The pilots will have to destroy these three targets using any armament they have as quickly as possible. Attack! The pilots attempt their first passes at the bomber, and the first to report target destroyed is the German fighter. Thanks to its three mighty cannons installed close to the center of the fuselage, it can start firing at greater distances. The next to succeed is the French pilot, whose thick volley basically saws the bomber into halves. One by one, the Japanese, the Soviet, and the Italian contestants finish the bomber off. Now, it takes the American and the British planes much longer time and more effort to get it done. The next target is the SPAAG. The Bearcat, the Mustang, and the Spitfire have rockets, so they destroy it immediately. The Italian and the Japanese made the decision to keep the bombs for later, so they use their cannons, while the German and the Soviet planes simply don't have any suspended armament, so cannons it is. Finally, the last target is the Centurion. The Brit sends an accurate rocket salvo, and the tank's as good as gone. The Bearcat, Ki-84, G-56, and the Mustang drop the bombs they kept for that stage, to the same result. Now the TA and the LA seem to be having problems. No matter how many rounds they send at the Centurion, they barely scratch it. So, let's sum up. 
The Italian G56 receives no place on the pedestal, but the prettiest livery definitely deserves the audience award. The American Mustang receives the bronze medal. Its high flutter point and good assault capabilities make it a worthy opponent for its class. The silver goes to the British Spitfire for its high climb rate, maneuverability and suspended armament. And finally, the winner today is ta -da, the French Bearcat. Its exceptional flight performance, deadly 20mm cannons and wide choice of suspended armament leave no chance of survival for its enemies. Well, now it's time to pull off the helmets, rest the heartbeat and start answering some of your questions. The first question was sent by a player called Akshat Tiem. How do I set up wheel brakes for my aircraft when I land to slow them down? Hi there. The setting you need is found in Controls, Aircraft. Choose Full Real Controls, Mechanization and set up the key binds for left and right brake. Then you can go back to Mouse Aim. Doggo asks, Please do an elaborate the difference between T-80U and T-90. Hi, Doggo. The main advantage of the T-80 is its great mobility that allows for flanking attacks. The T-90 boasts a better turret protection and more pen with its APF-SDS rounds. Another question comes from Wafflebird. Which aircraft has the highest climb rate? Hi there. The record for the highest climb rate belongs to the Italian F-104S, a whopping 260 meters per second. Then there's a question sent in by Daza848. Do you have any tactics and strategy for using early helicopters with only unguided weapons and no ATGM? Hello there. For early helicopters, you might want to hug the ground as much as possible. Approach enemy tanks from behind, find some cover, and leave it only to send some rockets. And the last comment for today was written by Chaos Saber. What is the best strategy in Sinai and Sands of Sinai? Hi there. The answer to this question is too long for the hotline section, so let's see what we can do about it in the next map guide. That's it for today. You have been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. And the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Come on, you guys. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and I'll see you in exactly one week on the 10th of January.